You guys, thank you so much for being here. I didn't realize they'd put me in such a, such a big room. I wouldn't have uh, had that last whiskey in the shower this morning <laughs> if, I, if I knew I'd had to present to such a big crowd. But, uh, uh, but thanks. Um, so I'm going to cover an interesting topic uh, this morning. It's no longer morning, is it? Afternoon. Um, and I've, I've had a really interesting last year. I've had this opportunity to work uh, on some projects that are completely outside my field of expertise. Uh, but it started really humbly. And so I'll, I'll start at the beginning where all good stories start and, uh, and take you on this journey. And in the end, uh, I want to show you this really cool project that I, uh, that I worked on. What you see up here is a Kinect. Many of you might be familiar with it. It's the sensor that comes with uh, Microsoft's Xbox gaming console. Um, and I grew fascinated with it because it's actually an incredibly advanced sensor. Uh, and I wanted to do something really compelling with it uh, using web technology. And so at the end of my demo, I'm gonna, or at the end of my spiel, I'm going to show you how I used the Kinect to render 3D live images or render a 3D environment in real time, but we'll get there soon enough. I'll start at the beginning. Um, so my journey here started uh, about two years ago when I got a job at HBO. It was an awesome gig, and it was right at the time when Angular was beginning to sort of take root. It was, I think it was 0 0.7, 0 0.07, or 0 0.08, like, or something like that. It was in, uh, it was in alpha. And there weren't a lot of enterprise clients adopting it. And so we spent some time talking to Google, and they convinced us that this would be an awesome framework to build the next generation of HBO software on. Uh, so we got at it and realized that Angular is an incredibly powerful platform, not just for building web tools, but it can be an incredibly powerful platform for building software in general. Um, and this is kind of the position that I'm going to try to argue today. It's a bit of a controversial one. But I think that the, technology that we, the technologies that we use to build the modern web have evolved past the web itself. The technologies that we use to build the modern web can reach outside of the browser. And we can begin doing things with them that were previously unheard of. Things like building interfaces for real world objects. And what do I mean by this? So many of you might be familiar with this phrase that's been tossed around recently, the Internet of Things. It's kind of a meaningless phrase, uh, like all things are in the beginning, but it has profound implications. What it means is that more and more of the devices in our lives are beginning to be connected. And what's more important than the fact that they're beginning to be connected is that everyday people, people who aren't technicians, are beginning to use technology in really interesting ways in the real world, not just on their computer. I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with the company Nest. Uh, maybe you've heard of it. They, they, they create this crazy $200 thermostat. If you'd have told me two years ago that somebody was going to convince me to pay $200 for an aftermarket thermostat, I'd have told you to get out. But this thing is amazing. Uh, it's, it's a learning thermostat. It, it interacts with the way that you choose to heat and cool your home and learns your habits. It talks to other Nest devices in your home to create this network. It sends data back and forth to help you build a more comfortable home without having to interact with it. That means a whole lot. It means that we're starting to think about the way human beings touch all the things that we cross in order to get, our, to, to, to get the work we need to get done done. Um, what's really profound about what Nest has begun is that there's, there was a study done by, by, by uh, Gartner, and they said that by the year 2020, 26 billion devices are going to be connected in our homes, in our lives, in our workplaces, in industry. Whereas in 2010, there were about 1 billion connected devices. This means that there's going to be a point in time in, 10, in less than 10 years where very few of the things we touch are going to be designed without human interface in mind. And you'll be surprised about how many of those things are currently designed without human interface in mind, because we think that our phones, you know, these, these really amazing pieces of technology that we carry around in our pocket right now are the end all and be all of technology, and they're really not. These are, these are incredibly powerful computers, but they're computers nonetheless. They've just shrunk them down into something that fits in the palm of your hand. 
Uh, but computers are going to start finding their ways or finding their, their, their way into, into really strange places like coffee machines and, and, uh, and the dashboard of your car. And how are we going to make those things easier for people to interact with? And so in my demo, I'm going to show you guys how I did this relatively, you know, the, the, what I'm going to show you doesn't have a huge impact on the world. But the technology stack that I used to put it together is supposed to be an example of how we can create compelling user interfaces, or at the very least, how we can use web technology to create interfaces for things that don't just live inside of a computer. And I think that's a really meaningful thing for us as web developers, because it means that our skills can now translate outside of the browser. So in, uh, on my journey here, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> It's, it's hard to talk about this because it's, it's, it's been such a weird journey for me. Um, so I started at HBO, we started working with Angular, and because we were, we were one of the first people to adopt Angular in the enterprise, I got an opportunity to do a lot of really interesting speaking engagements, talking about Angular, talking about how, uh, how interfaces are changing, how web technology is changing in it. And uh, I participated in an internal like HBO hackathon that was, uh, that was amazing, and we built some really cool tools that, that might show up in the future uh, for any of you HBO fans. I can't talk about it or I'll be sniped somehow through the building. Um, and, uh, and, and then something really, really remarkable happened to me, uh, which is somebody uh, at one of the talks I was at told me about this hackathon that NASA was putting on. Uh, it's, I don't know if any of you have heard of the, Na uh, the uh, NASA's Global Space Apps Challenge, but it's this attempt to unlock reams and reams and reams of NASA data and technology, provide it to the general public, and see what awesome things they could do with it. The first year they did it, there was a huge response. So the second year, people said, hey, NASA, that was a lot of fun, but come on, give us a challenge. And so NASA decided to present a set of challenges that they thought would really tax the people that would show up to this hackathon. And one of the challenges was super, super fascinating to me. Because I'd recently watched the movie Prometheus. I don't know if you guys have, have seen that movie. But in Prometheus, there's this little, there's this little drone um, that, that they send into a subterranean cave ahead of them exploring it. And it has uh, something called LIDAR, which is uh, laser something range finding. I forget exactly what LIDAR stands for. But what it does is it scans the walls of this cave as it moves through the cave in three dimensions and builds a real-time 3D map. And I was like, that is awesome. I would like to build that, but I'm a JavaScript developer. <laughs> you know, so. Um, so I, uh, so it, right around the same time, I, I saw that this, this, this NASA uh, hackathon was coming up. And one of the challenges is related to uh, this attempt, this ridiculously audacious attempt NASA uh, is going to undergo in the next couple years to rendezvous with, capture, and return to near Earth an asteroid. Um, like, this is happening, people. Like, NASA's sending a little spacecraft that's, you know, it's gonna wrap a big bag around an asteroid and then drag it back to orbit around Earth. Uh, you know, like, I hope, really hope they watch the Armageddon, because uh, that ends poorly. Um, but, but what's amazing about that is um, this crazy audacious plan showed up in a hackathon uh, for the general public. And the challenge was that NASA's not going to know a whole lot about this asteroid until it gets back to Earth. And there's a lot of interesting things that the surface of an asteroid can tell you about extra, the possibility of extraterrestrial life, the possibility of water being contained in large volumes in the asteroid belt so that we could use it as a waypoint for deep spacecraft that can convert the water into hydrogen fuel, which is rocket fuel is nothing but hydrogen and oxygen separated. And when you put it together, there's more or less a big bang. Um, and so they wanted to know all of this before the six year journey of this asteroid back to Earth. And so they said, how could we do that? How can we survey the surface of this asteroid? And so me and this small team of people, well, we have an idea. What if you sent a very tiny little spacecraft to it um, aboard the main spacecraft, it popped off, surveyed the surface, uh, and then return the data back to, to, to Earth ahead of time. And, and so we go, great, so let's show up and, uh, and, and build a spaceship in 48 hours. Uh, and you know, so we show up and then we go, well, how do we build a spaceship? <laughs> in an unlimited amount of time, let <laughs> alone 48 hours. Uh, so we decided to use a drone to prototype it. And so we built this sonar, uh, mounted it on top of the drone, 
and we ended up winning the best hardware prize at this uh, NASA hackathon because we flew the drone around the room and mapped the surf or mapped the walls in real time with this sonar. And it was this amazing, it was this amazing moment for me because I've always been interested in space, like probably everybody in this room, if you're a nerd, you're interested in space. It fascinates you in this deep way. But it's so inaccessible, right? It's, it's, it's space, literally, it's space, it's out there. It's like, how do we get there? How, do, how does my life as a JavaScript developer allow me to affect the course of human exploration in space? Uh, and, and so we, you know, it was, it was this amazing moment to see this drone fly and to hear people from NASA go, well, well that's kind of crazy. That's, that's an interesting idea that you could use terrestrial technology to prototype potential space missions. Um, and, uh, and, and a set of incredibly amazing things happened after that, the most of which is two weeks after this, uh, this, this hackathon, we get a call from NASA, um, and you know, I'm just, I'm writing JavaScript because it's what I do, and a phone call comes in and they're like, hey, James, this is NASA. Um, you should come down to DC because we're actually going to try to capture this asteroid and we think you have an interesting idea. And I turned to my wife and I'm like, you know, and like I, I joke around with my wife too much. So I think she was just like, shut up. You know, that's enough. Uh, and I'm like, no, I, I, honest to God, like it wasn't a call, it was an email. And you know, I showed her the email and she was like, what are you gonna do? I was like, I guess I'm gonna go to DC. And, and I don't know what I'm gonna be able to help them with, but. Uh, so we show up and we start talking. And what I realized was so profound about that moment was we as JavaScript developers have been given this amazing tool, which is that we can rapidly prototype interfaces and rapidly prototype data access in a way that's not been entirely available to the rest of the programming world. Compiled languages often have with them a great deal of legacy or a great deal of process in order to get a small thing done. But almost everyone in this room has probably participated in or used an open source project. And these projects tend to spring up in, in, at moments. Right? Somebody's sitting around and they can't figure out a way to solve a problem and they sit down and they, and they make it happen because the JavaScript stack is so incredibly flex flexible and the open source community has embraced it so, so tightly that it allows us to do rapid prototyping in this amazingly, amazingly compelling way. And so when we sat down as this group of developers, I mean, we had some like scientists and stuff on the team that we ended up recruiting, we realized that we, have, we, we were able to, to figure out the minimum, minimal set of tools we needed to, to create something really interesting out of this project. And we, we, we went and got up uh, one of those Parrot drones from, from Radio Shack, and, and, uh, and it turns out that inside of those Parrot drones, they're running a Linux, a, a tiny little Linux processor. So we were like, oh, well, let's just put Node on that thing. Um, you know, we'll write an interesting interface for it. We'll have Node send some socket I.O. messages uh, with data coming from the sonar that we built that's hooked into the serial port on the, on the, uh, uh, on the drone. And I, you know, we'll figure out how to read a serial port. And Node's a system level language. How hard could it be? Um, and, uh, and, and because of that, we, you know, we were able to come up with this really compelling and interesting tool. And, and, uh, and then I started thinking really, really hard about what that really meant. What it meant is that perhaps the reason that so many of the devices in our lives are hard to use is because that they don't is because designing interfaces for those devices uh, doesn't come as easily as designing interfaces for the web. Um, so I came up with this idea to quantify the stack that you need to create a compelling interface for something that doesn't sit on your browser into three things, and that's the thing. So the thing is the thing you're trying to create, the thing you're trying to manipulate. This is, in this case, it'll be a connect sensor, but it could be anything else. It could be a, a coffee machine. It could be a, why do I keep using that example? Why would anyone want a computer in a coffee machine? Anyway, um, uh, the bridge and the interface. Um, and, and what I'm going to show you, the thing is the connect. Uh, the bridge is Node.js, but this can be any other system, any system language uh, that you have available to you. I like Node.js personally. Uh, because it allows me to not have to change my frame of mind between being a front-end developer and being a middle-tier developer, and Node is also a system-level language. Um, and then AngularJS. Now, Angular is not, uh, there's nothing unique about Angular that makes this happen or not happen, but what I do like about it is that Angular uh, enforces 
structure in ways that other JavaScript frameworks tend not to, and there's definitely other JavaScript frameworks that do this, but structure is one of the most important things when you're working out in, when you're working in, in an uncomfortable place. If somebody gives you some basic structure, then you don't spend the first two weeks of a new programming language or programming technology trying to figure out how the hell to instantiate a controller or something ridiculous like that, or whether or not to use MVC or MVVM, or as Angular calls it, MVWM, you know, model view, whatever. Um, uh, which I love. Uh, so, um, so let's talk about, uh, you know, a little bit about the thing. In, in this case, I chose to use uh, the Connect because the Connect is a compelling thing. I heard the story of the invention of the Connect, and it was developed, I think, by a group of Israeli computer scientists and hardware experts that were trying to create a 3D sensor for the military. I could have made that up, so don't quote me on that. Um, I probably made it up, actually. Um, but, uh, but it, has, it has a really interesting origin story, and when the Kinect came out, this sensor was so far ahead of its field, it's insane that it ended up as a game system and not as something else. Um, and, uh, and so it was a natural evolution from our original prototype that used sonar to do 3D mapping, uh, because it has a little laser embedded into it that fires off this sort of array of dots, and it measures the intensity of the light reflected back in order to build a, what's called a depth map, um, which is exactly what it sounds like, a map of the depth points in its field of view. Um, and, uh, uh, but just because, you know, I'm, I'm using a connect now, and a connect interfaces with a computer via USB, but Node.js allows you system access to whatever, whatever transport you want. Um, I've done some, uh, you know, I've done some projects that use Arduinos over serial, I've done some projects that use Bluetooth, um, and, if you can send them through a, a, a bridge, uh, you know, like Node.js, you can turn them into whatever it is you need for the browser. Um, so, uh, the bridge being Node.js. And so, what's, what's compelling about Node uh, is, is twofold. Uh, one, as I already discussed, it, I, I don't have to switch mindsets to go from programming something on the front end to programming something on the back end to creating my bridge. But Node also has something that's really special about it, um, which is that it's built with asynchronicity in mind. And this is something really important when you're interfacing with the real world because you don't control when you're going to get data. Uh, you don't control when something goes wrong. It's the real world and it doesn't function inside of the walled garden of your machine. Uh, and so having a, having a framework that's naturally asynchronous is incredibly helpful. Now other languages can absolutely do this. Um, I was having a discussion last night and somebody mentioned like, you know, Go would be a really, really great language to, to, to do this kind of thing on, and I totally agree. Uh, but uh, Node is a great place to start. Um, I, I had a colleague who just, you know, we're working on this project and last night he sent me this message and he said, uh, you know, I'm trying to solve this problem um, and, uh, and I know you've been writing all of this in Node.js, uh, but you know, you're away at this conference and all I know is Python. I said, write it in Python. Write in what you know, because the most comfortable thing you, ha you know is what's going to allow you to get to the next step faster. Chances are, the code that you write now is not going to end up in production, but the idea that you create now is. Uh, so create the idea, you can refactor later, and Node is uh, a great rapid prototyping tool for, for people who already know JavaScript. Um, and then Angular. So I picked Angular, uh, again, because it enforces this amazing structure. Um, I attended a really great talk about Ember JS this morning, and uh, I think Ember and Angular are, are sort of in the same department, perhaps a little different, in that they don't just give you the tools that you need uh, to create a web application, like Backbone does. Backbone just says, here, here's the, you know, here's the pile of, of, of I-beams laying on the ground. You put them together into a building, right? Um, Angular uh, and, and Ember tend to say, you know, well, here's some prefab pieces. Assemble these prefab pieces into something that looks recognizable. Ember takes it an, a step further. Uh, one of the reasons I chose Angular over Ember is because Angular, from the beginning, had a really, really compelling testing story, and I've become obsessive compulsive about testing. You don't want me on your team. It's, uh, it's problematic. <laughs> it's a drug. Uh, but. Uh, uh, but it's, it's got this beautiful, beautiful testing story. And anybody that's spent a significant amount of time in front-end development knows that one of the, thing that's, one of the things that's been missing from front-end development uh, is, is a compelling testing story. I came from a back-end world doing .NET. I apologize. I'm, uh, I'm cured. Uh, but 
uh, .NET was amazing in that it was heavily structured and really, 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 really testable. Um, and I missed that when I first arrived in the front end world. It's like, how do you test things? You kind of start, but there's no conventions, and so you get lost, this, 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 and that. Um, and, uh, and so yeah, so that's why I chose Angular. I don't want to spend too much time on slides uh, because I tend to be, I tend to talk quite a bit and, uh, and I'll talk for an hour and not give you any actual information. So I want to show you uh, what I made. Um, so first things first, I'm going to try to, I'm going to run it and then I'm going to, I'm going to uh, tell you what's going on. Um, I'm a man that likes to tempt the demo gods so this could end in two ways, uh, two of which are fire. So, all right, okay, no fire. So what's happening, hopefully, when I refresh this page, and it'll take a moment, is, oh, there we go, almost. So what should happen, <laughs> is uh, the, the connect is grabbing, uh, it's taking some time to boot up, but the connect is grabbing what's called a depth frame. Um, and what it does is it's, it fires its lasers and builds this array uh, of dots that indicate a depth at any given point in time. And what that depth array, uh, what happens to that depth array is it gets sent to Node.js as a byte stream. Um, and the values of that byte stream represents the depth of that individual pixel. Uh, that byte stream then gets forwarded using sockets, uh, you know, this being our bridge, to the front end, to the AngularJS instance. Uh, the example I'm showing you isn't going to do this, but the proper way to ingest it with AngularJS is to wrap that socket IO layer as a service, because that's literally what it is, uh, and then present that data to whomever it is, or whatever module it is that's going to be displaying that data. In this case, it's an AngularJS directive. And in AngularJS, a directive is the module type that allows you to manipulate the DOM, uh, or at least it's the place where you should be doing your DOM manipulation. I've heard some talk that they may be getting rid of directives or changing them in some way. I don't know how true that actually is. Uh, let me give this a restart. Use a no window. It, uh, by design, it crashes when you breathe. Right. There we go. All right. So, what you're seeing right now, if I back up, let's see if you can kind of see me, is sort of a matrix style. Yeah, thank you, I deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's no more though, because it didn't work right away. Um, yeah, and so what's crazy about this is, well first you'll notice how slow it is. It took me three weeks to just get this video here, uh, because what's, what's happening is each one, each frame is, 600, uh, is 640 by 480, uh, coming from the byte stream. And then you have to build a mesh in WebGL, that's the same. Uh, and originally, you know, 60 times a second, every time the frame hit, it was running through each vertice in that mesh and updating it with data that was coming from here. So it was super memory intensive. Um, it, I forget exactly how many vertices I ended up with, but it was insane. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can zoom in. Do a little bit of panning. And you see it cuts things off when you pan to the side because it's, like I said, it's just a point cloud, really. Um, all right, I'm gonna shut this down while my luck's ahead. Uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's kind of what happened. I, I wanted to bring the drone to show you guys uh, how, it, how it works when it's mounted to it. I, I got an opportunity to do a show for the Discovery Channel using this and we mounted we mounted the connect to the drone, flew it around, and mapped the studio in real time and the, and the host. Uh, uh, but it's, we custom built this new drone, and so it absolutely looks like a piece of military equipment. And I'm learning not to travel with it if I can help it. Uh, we got stopped at the Canadian border. Um, 
And I'd imagine that's the closest I've ever come to getting shot with an assault rifle, ever. Because <laughs> the border guard was not impressed by my explanation. <laughs> it was just, mm-hmm, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and I'm not, not an American citizen either, so that helped a lot. Uh, uh, so, so, right, so let me show you what's actually happening here. I'm going to go into, uh, how are we doing on time? Wow, oh, look at that. All right. So this is, can you guys see that? Does it, does it look all right? So, uh, so I'm not going to, uh, I don't want to delve too much into code because it always makes demos awkward, but um, what's, uh, what we're looking at here is, is the Node.js bridge uh, that I built. You know, up here I'm importing my dependencies. Um, and one of the things I love about Node is how quickly the community is starting to build tools to support it. So I started writing my own connect driver. Uh, and I posted online, and somebody was like, why don't you just do the NPM import connect? I'm like, no. No, like, really? Like, somebody built the, yeah. So, you know, I mean, I'm not the first person to have thought about this, and so somebody built an NPM module uh, for connect, and so all I had to do was import it uh, instead of writing my own driver. And this is, again, one of those things that's kind of unique about uh, what JavaScript allows us to do because there's such a large community of people who already knew it when Node came along. This large, you know, this huge base of people were able to, to bring it up to speed with a lot of other languages and platforms uh, and create a lot of really compelling modules that uh, enable us to do interesting things. Um, without going too much into the details, I'll show you, uh, I'll show you the interesting bits, uh, most of which is I also, I also turned on uh, linting right before this, and I can't figure out how to turn it off, so my code is going to look as horrible as it was actually written. Um, uh, so here in this listen frame, what's happening is I'm grabbing that depth information from the, uh, uh, from the driver as it comes in, and then I'm creating this map in which, uh, and this is mostly where the slowdown happens, is I loop through every single uh, vertice that's being created, and I have to do some bit shifting in order to get it to where I want uh, because of the way that the, the, uh, the, the individual uh, depth map points are are encoded, um, and, and then down here, I'm using sockets to basically collect all of the information and uh, create a, uh, a WebSocket stream that's streaming this data to the browser, uh, and this directive here is basically the entirety of this application. Um, and so what's happening here is I have an AngularJS directive. Most of the meat is inside of this link function. Uh, you know, I'm doing, a, you know, I'm gra I have this WebSocket stream library. And what's really interesting about this library is that it was not built to be used on the browser. It was built to be used by Node.js. That's why you see this require here. Um, require doesn't work, at least not in exactly the same way, on the browser. Uh, but there's an application called Browserify that lets you take Node.js modules and convert them so that they can be used uh, uh, on the web. Um, you do end up with hundreds and hundreds of lines of garbage uh, in your code, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a really convenient tool for, for prototyping. Um, here I'm binding to, you know, you see mouse move, mouse wheel, mouse down and mouse up. I'm binding to the mouse event so that I can do things like scroll, zoom in, and zoom out. Um, and then down here, the really amazing stuff is happening. I'm using 3.js as my WebGL uh, library. Uh, I'm creating a 3.js mesh. And because I'm uh, converting everything in my Node.js instance, all I have to do uh, somewhere here my vertices, all right. So when I, when I get a message from the socket, I loop through every one of my vertices in that mesh, and then I set the Z index on each one of those vertices to the depth coming from the connect camera. Um, and then I update my vertices. Uh, here's just some, and all this gobbledygook is what Browserify adds. It's basically putting the web socket uh, or the, yeah, the WebSocket stream library into my code. Um, but all in all, the functional code that I wrote is 100 lines. I wrote 100 lines of browser code in order to make this happen. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's what the application looks like. Um, and 
one of the things I also wanted to talk about is, uh, you know, I wanted to spend some more time talking about why it was important that I used AngularJS for this particular example. Um, and when we've, we've began to develop a set of conventions for how we build web applications, independent of whatever tool it is you're using, independent of whether or not you're using, you know, backbone or, 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 you know, if you're holding out on prototype or if you're building something on the back end that's rendering to the front end. We've been doing this long enough as web developers that we have a set of conventions. Uh, but when we step outside of our, what's comfortable to us, when we start building tools to interface with the real world, we get a little bit lost. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why new frameworks often have this, this issue of like incredibly messy code, uh, because it takes people a couple years to figure out how to organize their code. Um, Angular actually doesn't enforce a particular structure intentionally. Um, so it's unlike Ember or, or Rails in that way. Um, so a couple, maybe a year ago, I created uh, an Angular Sprout project. Angular Seed is the, the Google hosted seed project that you're supposed to use to create the Angular application that you're going to eventually build, but I don't particularly like it. It's not super scalable. It forces you to put a lot of cross, con you know, cutting concerns into the same files. So I created Angular Sprout as an example for how you could build something that could potentially scale out to be a massive application. So inside of my app folder here, um, there's a lot of stuff in here that's going to, to, to get cut out. You see I have like a controllers folder, a directives folder, uh, a, a services folder, and inside of those folders go the obvious modules, directors, you know, directors, filters, controllers, um, and services. Uh, but what's more important than that, uh, I haven't put all my things in there yet, so I'm, so I'm now going to do the opposite of what I just told you and show you this, this menu folder that I'd created. When I first tried to do this, I, was, I, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if everything related to one particular type of structure you were trying to create, in this case it was a menu, went into one folder. And so this was an experiment that ended up failing uh, because it made sense when you were like, oh, there's a menu, it's gonna need a service, it's gonna need these filters, it's gonna need this kind of partial. Um, but then you realize that that's not the way good programmers program. The way good programmers program is we build, we build small pieces of software that have lots of cross-cutting you know, cross potential. Uh, and so putting something into a folder related specifically to the type of you know, UI element you're trying to create is going to, you're gonna end up with a lot of duplicated code. And so that's why I'm switching to this newer structure. Um, but what's more important than that is the actual, uh, you know, I'll show you my Angular Sprout code here. I wanna talk to you about the, the testing story that I, that, I, that I spoke to you earlier about. Now this is a very simple controller. Uh, what it does is it uses a menu service to grab menu items put them on the scope so that they can be rendered. It's pretty simple. But there's actually a lot of things going on here. Angular uses this dependency injection pattern. Um, for those of you that come from the back end, uh, you, you understand what dependency injection is. It's still a fairly new thing that's been introduced to front end frameworks. Um, but what's really powerful about it is it allows you to heavily, heavily mock out back ends. And so in this case, the back end is the menu service. Uh, as you can see, pointing to my screen, that's not helpful. <laughs> um, uh, you know, menu.get is the menu service. Um, and here in my controller, using Jasmine and Karma, uh, you can see I'm mocking out my menu in this incredibly easy way. This was what sold me uh, on using Angular in combination with Jasmine, is I have just, in this simple statement, mocked out my entire menu service, which isn't very complicated, uh, but now I can test this controller in total isolation without having to worry about how it's interfering with my controller. And uh, you can see here, I'm now enforcing certain behavior. So I'm using promises. For those of you who are unfamiliar with promises, uh, you should get familiar if you're doing front-end uh, programming. Promises are an incredibly powerful way uh, to, uh, to, to do asynchronous, uh, to work with asynchronous callbacks. Um, they allow you to guarantee a return from the person that you're calling, uh, uh, calling a function from. So here I'm mocking out my service. Uh, I'm automatically resolving it to items that I've defined up here. So I've sort of mocked my data layer. Um, and down here when I write my test, I just you know, 
I call scope.items, uh, which is the controller function, and write my expectation. I expect the data to be the items that I defined up above. Uh, this isn't directly related to the example I was showing you with the connect, but it's an example of how you get for free this amazing complete set of application development tools and patterns. Uh, and it should give you a little bit of bravery to venture outside of the browser and creating really compelling experiences for, uh, for interacting with the real world. Um, I don't know, have you guys heard of the Raspberry Pi? I don't know, are you familiar? The Raspberry Pi is an amazing device. Um, it sort of follows in the vein of uh, Arduinos and these other small embedded controllers that are beginning to find their way into hobbyist lives. And what the Raspberry Pi is, for those that aren't familiar, it's a tiny little credit card sized Linux computer. Um, and it's not that impressive if you think about what an iPhone is. Right? An iPhone is a massively powerful computer, like incredibly powerful, and it's something that's very small. But an iPhone is also, you know, 800 bucks if you were to buy it outright. A Raspberry Pi is $25. What this means is that the technologies necessary to run a really powerful stack are growing smaller and growing cheaper geometrically. Things are getting so incredibly inexpensive. So it means that tiny, tiny little devices, things that don't have screens necessarily, or things that uh, don't have massive keyboards or hundreds and hundreds of different types of input and output are going to be running full stack computers on them. This is going to present an opportunity for the people designing these things to think differently about how to create interfaces for them. Right now, if I wanted to write an interface for an embedded piece of hardware, right, if I wanted to create the next Next, the Nest, uh, I would have to use C. It was, it's the only option, right? Uh, because inside, I presume, inside of a Nest is not a Linux computer. Inside of a Nest is probably uh, some sort of embedded microcontroller, and so you've got to write all of this framework code just to get something as simple as a number to change from one thing to another. Uh, but that's going to change really, really soon because for, for I, I think the, the, the cheapest ARM uh, x86, or not x86, x6, but the, the cheapest ARM processor capable of running Linux now is under 10 bucks. It might be under five bucks. Soon it's going to be under a dollar, which means that these things are going to be everywhere. And we, I think, are better positioned than almost anybody to introduce a new paradigm into embedded programming. Let's use JavaScript, because JavaScript allows us to do rapid prototyping. It has this built-in asynchronicity. It has this amazing community of people who are going to create software to allow us to extend it in really compelling ways. And this is just one example of how we did that. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to spend too much time uh, being a philosopher. I want to uh, get some feedback from you guys. Um, uh, I want to find out what you think, what questions you have um, about this or, other, or the whiskey I was drinking in the shower. Uh, you know, so, um, so that's kind of my talk, and uh, I'd love to hear back. Thank you. Questions? Sure. Okay, so it's a silly question. Yeah. So when is the asteroid due? Say what? When is the asteroid due to arrive? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm not the master of schedule uh, on that thing. But it, so I think the plan is by 2016, they want to have launched the craft. And I think by the early 2020s, they want to actually have the asteroid in what's called cislunar orbit. And cislunar orbit is, a, is a, it's sort of, it's an orbital plane somewhere between the moon and the Earth that takes advantage of something called a Lagrange point, uh, which is a point between the Earth and the, and, and, and the moon where their gravity cancels one another out. So you need a lot less what's called delta V, basically rocket power, uh, to hold station and do maneuvers and that sort of thing. Um, and this, is, this actually brings up another interesting point, which is that if you guys, you know, if you guys are looking for a really compelling project, if you're looking for some super amazing data, go look through NASA's open source repositories. It is unbelievable the stuff they're giving away for free. I was talking to an astrophysicist a couple weeks ago, and he told me that every astrophysicist that's trained uh, these days uh, learns their craft mostly on a database that was built sometime in the 80s and the 90s. It's called, it's, I, can't, I can never remember the name, but it has an absurd name like the Intergalactic Database or uh, something. Strange like that, but it's literally a database of every single extraterrestrial object in our universe, um, and it's open. It's free. Uh, think about 
what you can create with that. I had a friend uh, that just a couple weeks ago created this game that used real-time data about the positions of asteroids in our asteroid belt to create a game uh, that would allow people to like, you know, you have to build a craft and launch it and get it to land on an asteroid, but what's happening is that game is feeding data back to NASA about how to design better orbits to get to these asteroids so that you can mine them for resources. And this is an amazing opportunity to do some serious world-changing stuff with this, with this free data that NASA is giving up. Um, and I, I think they're about to do a big, uh, a big dump of, of data coming up. And then there's one really interesting project. If you guys want to get super nerdy, there's, and you do, um, there's, uh, uh, there's a project, or there, there's a spacecraft called ICE. And ICE is this, it, it's, a, it's a spacecraft that was launched in the 60s or the 70s. I can't remember exactly what it was. And it was, it was, it was built really, really well, but NASA ran out of money to run it. And some guy, I'm going to call him Jeff, because it seems like Jeff's do this kind of thing, uh, forgot to turn it off <laughs> when the funding ran out. And, uh, and so it just kept drifting through space, unbeknownst to anybody. And then recently, we started hearing some signals. Uh, so this spacecraft is returning to Earth, and it's been exploring our solar system. We have no idea what it's learned. But only one of the 13 instruments it was endowed with have failed. So this thing has been gathering data for the last 30 years, and nobody knows anything. This has been this zombie satellite drifting throughout our solar system. And NASA can't, or won't, more can't, fund the, uh, fund the ability to turn the, the telescope back on that's capable of downloading the data from, or turn the radio back on that's capable of downloading the data. So this thing is going to fly right past us. I'm going to miss this treasure trove that it's had. So, I've been talking to this group of, of geeks in, in, uh, back in New York, and there's people all over the world who are trying to figure out how to build a giant radio, uh, basically a giant radio beacon so that they could download the data from this spacecraft that's, that's about to drift by us. And there's, there's been talk of attempting to reprogram it, uh, because it can be done, theoretically, and it has a little bit of fuel left in it, so you can change its course and send it on a, on a new mission. And so there might be this effort by amateur programmers and astronomers to try to hack into a zombie NASA spacecraft flying by us and send it on a new mission. And this is stuff that's totally accessible to us. Uh, you know, I, NASA probably wouldn't appreciate it if you reprogrammed it, but if they don't want it, um, you, know, it you know, I went off on a bit of a tangent, but my point is um, uh, there's, there's so much compelling stuff that, uh, that we're now capable of doing. Um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I've seen young students uh, write amazing pieces of software against NASA databases uh, uh, because this data is just sitting there unused and the interfaces are terrible. So people can't do science because it takes them too long to find the data that they need. So, yeah. Um, any other questions? Not so much? All right. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah.